the heartbeat has an effect like that on people, doesn't it? <laughs> Something's happening. Something weird. All right, sweet. Hey, affections of the heart. Here we are. So listen, uh, before we get to there, though, I want to say one thing to you guys. Uh, man, I just love coming together with you guys. It's a blast, right? I love the family of God coming together to worship Jesus and hear from him and do all this. And so, man, thank you uh, just for being with us to worship with us today. We're excited for that. And uh, who's my hunters in the room? Raise your hands. We thought y'all had died, and uh, especially you. And so <laughs> we're just calling people out today. We're going to do some repentance for that, but before anyway. Uh, but no, I actually don't want to say anything about that. I actually want to do this. Uh, this is called a prayer card, everybody. You know what this is? Take a guess. Yeah, you can write a prayer request on the back of it, right? Awesome, yeah? Well, here's the thing. I want to explain a couple things to you. So where do these go? People want to know, right? Where do these go? So here, here's the deal. When we get these prayer request cards, we look at them, we go, hey, we got a, we got a team of two women who screen them and say, hey, this is appropriate for the masses. This is not appropriate for the masses, okay? And so uh, what we do is we, we, we mean intentionally, and we, and we do this, we pray for you guys every single week. Um, this is a team dedicated to doing this. Um, but there's also a prayer chain that goes out at Highland Park Community Church. So if you've got a prayer request, you need the body praying for you. are like, man, hit this thing up. Like, I need people praying for me. How many of you guys know you need people praying for you? Yeah, like, I know this. I, I expect you guys to be praying for me. So you better not let me down there, okay? Because I need it from you. I'm praying for you. But this prayer card, guys, we, we, we want you guys to fill these out. Put, these, put your prayer requests on these things so we can pray for you, okay? Um, if you want it just to be private, you can just mark it private for us. All right, let us know. We'll keep it, we'll keep it in, the, in the closed circles. But here's what we want to do. If you want to be on the prayer chain, and being on the prayer chain is not so that you know uh, what's going on. Someone's like, he's preaching and he's not even preaching yet, right? Like, this is not a gossip line, okay? What this is is a prayer request chain, which goes, listen, I need Jesus to do something, so I'm going to ask people to pray with me on that, okay? So if you want to receive that because you're someone who prays, then I want you to fill this card out today. I want you to put your phone number on there and just write on there, hey, add me to the prayer chain, and we'll make sure you're getting those things, okay? So fill that out, throw it in the box on your way out, and, uh, and we'll do that there. So prayer cards are in there. But hey, by the way, if you're new, there's a white card in there that says, welcome home. We'd love to get your information, write it down there for us so we can connect with you. And if you have decided to follow Jesus um, in, in this, this faith, if God's moving your heart in that way. If he's calling your name, I want to know that because I want to talk to you about that, okay? So I want you to put your name on that, write that down, slip it in. It's a yellow card. You can put that in there, okay? So that's good. Those are the cards in your seats, yes? We'll talk about the big white card next week, so come prepared for that one, all right? Perfect. Hey, affections of the heart. We're starting a new series today from misguided to undivided. How many of you guys recognize that sometimes you have a misguided heart? Come on. How many of you guys desire an undivided heart? to the Lord, right? I mean, isn't it, isn't it true? It's just, man, this is a human condition issue that we've got going on. And, and our prayer request, our hope for God to move in this time is that he would move us on this journey. We understand our heart a little bit more understand why it is we're doing the things that we're doing, what's going on under the hood, this kind of thing. And so I want to I preach to you today uh, this first one that we're going to do on the theology of the heart, okay? Now listen, um, it's going to be a little more cerebral. I want you to put your brains in here too today. How many of you guys like, love theology? You're like, yes, this is the day that I've been waiting for. And some of you are like, oh no, <laughs> I'm a pan-millennialist, it'll all pan out in the end, right? And so listen, we're going to preach some theology today, but this is important because theology shapes the way we live our lives. Right? It shapes the way that, that we think about things, and, and we have to understand what it is with the heart, why it is that we do the things that we do, what's going on at a base level that we need to deal with. And so I want to ask you guys to just stay with me today as we move through these. So we're going to move through some texts. We're going to hit some things. And I'm going to give you a caveat. Um, it's not going to resolve today. <laughs> just let that land on you for a moment, Okay. We're not going to, you're going to be like, man, he only spoke half the truth. Like, that's only half of it. And you're right. It's only going to be half of it today, okay? Here's what I'm doing. I'm praying, pray prayerfully. This doesn't backfire on us, but uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, we oftentimes move right to grace and redemption and we skip our sin, yes? We just go, man, pfft, over to, pfft, and here we are. And we never wrestle with what has happened in our life, what God has done in our hearts, what the, the miracle that God has done in bringing us from death to life. And so this weekend, you're going to leave, and it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a just a, what, the, what the existence of the heart is like, what's actually going on there. And you're going to feel a little tension when you leave the room, and that's okay. And I just invite you to wrestle with the Lord on that this week. And then if you want to hear the resolve to that, you've got to come back next weekend. How's that for clickbait for you? <laughs> that's what we're doing. 
partial. All right, good. So listen, we're going to dive into this thing, but we need the Lord to speak to us, yes? yes. Come on, let's go to him in prayer. Just, just lift your hands up to the Father here for just a moment. Let's just come to him receiving. Father in heaven, we're asking for you to speak to us today. God, we thank you that you've given us your word. We thank you that you tell us it's living and active, that it's, that it's moving, it's shaping, and it's cultivating, and it's transforming, God. And we need your transforming word today. Lord, we have hearts in here that need surgery today. Hearts in here that, that need things cut out, that need things bypassed, Lord, that need your Holy Spirit's life-giving power to raise from the dead today. Lord Jesus, I ask for you to do that. So God, would you speak? Lord, would we listen? God, open our eyes to your truth. Open our hearts to receive that truth today, Jesus. As, as we're just commanding our souls to praise you right now, I just invite you to command your heart. Open up, open up to the Lord. Just tell yourself, open up to Jesus. Hear his voice today. Just tell him you want to hear him. Just go ahead and pray to Jesus right now. Just take a moment. Church, if you would just pray for me. Pray that God would use his words in me. That it'd be edifying to you, that he'd use it to grow you. That he'd speak. Father, we love you. We praise you. And we look to you in honor. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Affections, affections, affections. We all have them. Yes? We all have affections, things that our hearts run after, things that we long for. Um, do you guys know that you are led by your affections? Anybody? Okay, think with me here. Some of y'all in here today, you're like, listen, um, <clears throat> I don't have those things called emotions. <laughs> I don't know what that is. How many of you in here today would be like, man, I'm just pretty even keel. Like, I'm not moved often by a lot of things. Like, I don't operate that way. Listen, our affections drive the way we do things. What we, what we think, we, we often think that our mind is what's driving the way that we do things, right? If I know the truth, I'll operate in the truth, yes? Uh, how do we know that's not true? Because how many of you love cheeseburgers? <laughs> and you know the truth about the cheeseburger, don't you? You know, 4,000 calorie cheeseburger won't do nothing to me, yeah? And we go after it, right? We, we, we devour things that we know are bad for us because we want them, yes? Affections, we're led by our affections. Here's the reality, church. We are, are led by our affections and major marketing companies know this. You know how they get you to buy a $20,000 Rolex watch? Do you know a $20,000 Rolex, $20, Rolex watch tells the time just as good as a $10 watch? Serves the exact same function, right? Does the same thing. A $10 watch uh, might even be better because you can't scratch it, or if you do, you don't care, right? <laughs> How do they get you to buy a watch like that? What do they do? What's their ad like? It's not just a list of details describing the watch, right? Because they're very few. <laughs> what is it? It's a commercial. It's a visual, right, of what? A man driving his $300,000 Rolls Royce with his watch glistening in the sun and his smoking hot babe over here on the right, right? He's like the champion of industry. He's killing it everywhere he goes. They're selling you a lifestyle, yes? The lifestyle that's congruent with a Rolex watch. They're going, this is what you need is that lifestyle. And the promise is the Rolex is going to get you that, isn't it? They're not selling you a watch. They're selling you a promise for a lifestyle, Right? Desires. We're led by our desires. We're led by our affections. How many of you guys love a good chick flick? <laughs> Come on, show of hands, show of hands. How many of you guys are like on the Hallmark like binge watching cruise session from now through January? <laughs> You're like, man, wow, I love movies with no plots whatsoever. <laughs> yes, it's the best, right? <laughs> How do they get you to watch? I want to know. I like plot. I need a plot. I need something different to happen, yes? And yet, there is a plot. It's just the same one recapitulated, right? <laughs> over and over and over and over again. And it's this girl who doesn't like this guy because she doesn't know that he turns out to be rich. And then, you know, they, they have a big old dramatic thing where she screws it up and they get back together and life is happier evermore, right? Yes? <laughs> Throw a Christmas tree in and you've nailed it. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's the way that it is, right? How do they get you to watch that? Because somehow in your heart you go, that is a man. <laughs> He's super rich. He can swing an ax. <laughs> He's romantic. He says all the right things. And he's got a whole lot of money. <laughs> Every time, same thing, right? Because they know your desires. 
You're led by your desires. And here's the deal. Our affections, we trust them, don't we? We come in, that feels right, that seems right. I'm gonna go after that. We follow them. And here's the reality, church. We're encouraged to do that. Yes? Listen to the messaging around you. Listen to what people will tell you. No, it's hard right now in my marriage. Yep, you're right. It's hard. You, should, you, should, you deserve more than that. Mm. Yeah, I do, right? My affections say, this isn't right. I don't like this. So I'm going to go this direction, right? We're fueled by that. You're right. And here's the reality. Our affections seem right to us, don't they? Like, man, this just... This seems like it would be better this way. I don't understand why it says this otherwise. I don't understand why it's doing this, but this is what feels right to me. So it seems right. And we're led by our desires and the voices today tell us that that's how it should be. All around us. You've heard it before. Say it with me. Listen to your heart. heart. Profound, profound bit of truth there, right? Listen to your heart. Heart. It's not just a laughing cliche, is it? It's, it's advice we give to people. This is something we say in many different ways in our culture. Jennifer Healy writes this on her blog. Above all other voices, listen to that. Above all other voices, listen to your heart. This, trust this internal guidance system to lead you down the right path. The more you tune in, the more it'll tell you. What will it tell you? You're wise, you're loving, you're kind, you're capable, you'll make it through. With love, you will. By grace, you will. Sounds fantastic, doesn't it? Just listen to your heart. It's in you. She goes on to quote 40 other quotes, which I'll read at length here now. Here we go. (laughs) Just kidding. Just going to do two for you. Cicero says this, nobody can give you wiser advice than yourself. Cicero. Nobody. Okay. Henry Winkler. (laughs) Yeah. Your mind knows only some things. You'd agree with that? Yes? I don't know all things. Okay. Your inner voice, your instinct, knows everything. Ooh. You're all knowing. If you listen to what you know instinctively, listen to these words, it will always lead you down the right path. Bravo. Bravo. I was searching for some Google quotes. I was actually trying to find stories of when people have listened to their heart and it's gone wrong, and they've just scrubbed those from the internet, just so you know, so don't waste your time. <laughs> but there's this number one site that keeps popping up, right, over and over again, and it's, it's uh, what's it called? Simple, minimal made simple. Minimal made simple, okay, it says this. While it can be a cliche line, listening to your heart never gets old. Ooh. Your heart is what determines your passion, desire, and love for people and things alike. Following your heart will lead to no regrets because you did it out of love. Oh, fantastic. She goes on to list seven reasons why you should start following your heart. Number one is you'll have no regrets, which she already said. Uh, Number two, you will discover who you are. Mm. Self-discovery, number one. Number three, you will easily forgive others if you follow your heart. (laughs) Like, I read that one and was like, wait a minute. Uh, How many people have 50-year grudges against their siblings? (laughs) Because their heart's not feeling all warm and fuzzy, right? I'm just following my heart. You will love yourself better if you follow your heart. If you follow your heart, you will trust your intuition. If you follow your heart, you will become happier. Promise. If you follow your heart, you will speak your own voice. Wow. Sounds good, right? Princess Diana told us this. Only do what your heart tells you. Only do what your heart tells you. I put that to practice this week, by the way, church. And my heart told me it didn't want to take out the trash. And so I just, I'm, I can't do it. I can't do it. And so I just did what my heart told me. And it was a great week, to be honest with you. Our marriage is great. And finally, one more for you guys. 
from love expert Nicholas Sparks <laughs> comes this beauty. Always listen to your heart. Classic. Because even though it's on your left side, it's always right. Oh, Nicholas. Bravo. That's a good one. We're there. Man. Guys, this rhetoric, like if I just, I just was overwhelmed by the amount of just this messaging out there, right? I'm not even digging deep here to find this, y'all. Like, it's just everywhere. We're not trying to dig it up from some grave somewhere. This is the way it is. It's the air around us. It's the messaging that's happening. And, and I think, by and large, one of the reasons we, we think this way is in credit to a, to a philosopher uh, from the 1800s named Ralph Waldo Emerson. If we were to summarize Emerson's philosophy, it's simply this, self-reliance. Self-reliance. All right, in his writings, his essay, Emerson tells his audience to pursue self-reliance, and he tells them these things. Not to care for the poor. Mm. Not to love your families. And not to listen to preachers. <laughs> You're like, okay, okay. He says this. Insist on yourself. Never imitate. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Hold your own row. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Think about that. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Wow. Emerson's motto is the creed of our times, which says this, trust thyself. Trust thyself. And we'd add, to your own self be true. Right? Trust thyself thyself. Guys, the pull of the world's messaging is that your heart can be trusted. Think about that. Fundamental to the world's understanding is that the heart is fundamentally good. Do you hear that? If you can trust your heart, it has to at base level be good, yes? Oh, I can't trust it. I can't follow it. But the messaging of the world is trust your heart. Follow your instinct. Go after what feels right to you. The message is that your desires are good, right? The message is you should love yourself, yes? Come on. Self-care, hello. You should trust yourself. You should pursue what sounds good and right to you. That's the message of our culture. And thank God that that message is only outside the church and not inside of it. It's just the world, right? It's just them, big bad them. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3. Paul is writing to Timothy, who's a pastor, who's leading churches. Timothy's a young man. Paul's writing to him, hey, this is the way things are. Explain some things to him, how to lead better, these kind of things. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, says this, but understand this, all right, tune in, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. How many of you guys are like, Amen. Right? In the last days, things like this are going to happen. What's going to happen? Verse 2. For people will be lovers of what? Self. Church. Everything that is about to be said in this paragraph, it's about to be added to this list of affections, flows from this statement. People will be lovers of self. What does it look like to love yourself? Let's read on. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to this, verse five. Having the appearance of what? Godliness. Godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. 
Church, think about the context of this passage. Who's he writing to? He's writing to Timothy, a pastor of a church. He's writing to the church. The people will be lovers of self is referring not to people out there, but to people in here. Guys, he's talking about people in the church. Listen to these phrases he's saying. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, not loving good, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Think about that. And then just think about all the other negative things that flow from having affections for yourself. Heartlessness, not being able to be pleased, slanderous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds great, doesn't it? So we gotta ask our, ourselves this question today. How did we get here? How did these affections of the heart, loving of ourselves? sweep both those outside of these walls and those inside these walls? How does that happen? How does that become pervasive? Why does this affect all people? I want to deal with that today. And so to deal with that, I want you to uh, turn your Bibles, if you have them, Jeremiah 17. I want you to see this in your text. Jeremiah. Jeremiah is a prophet who's pronouncing judgment that's going to come on Israel. He's, come, he's, he's announcing what's going to happen, that they're going to be taken captive, that this is what's going to go on in Judah. And, and he keeps pronouncing these judgments, and then nothing happens. And so people are like, really, Jeremiah, really? This is a thing, you know? And they're all kind of mocking him. If you read the whole text, you kind of see that thing happening. Uh, but in this, in this text, Jeremiah 17, verse 9, Jeremiah does a little exegesis of the heart. And he says these words. The heart... Everybody underline that word if you've got a pen near you, if you've got a pencil with you, underline that. The heart is deceitful above all things. Think about that. Above all things. You know what that means? The most deceitful thing that there is is what? The heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I spent time reading. I wanted to read these other translations to you so you can see this. The NLT says this. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately, what's the word? Wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Wow. Think about those words that are being used here, church. The NIV. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The NET, the New English Translation, this comes from my seminary, the professors there put this out, says this, the human mind is more deceitful than anything else. It is incurably bad. Who can understand it? When the Hebrew people talked about the heart, they're not talking about the one pound muscle in your body that pumps blood through your veins. How many of you guys know that? <laughs> When you're supposed to listen to your heart, are you supposed to put your head on your chest and try to hear that heartbeat from earlier? We're not talking about that, are we? What are we talking about? Very much like the Hebrew people, they're talking about the center of your will and emotions. The heart was viewed as, as representing your logic, your reason, your decision-making, and your affections. Everything is said to flow from the heart. It's where you get your feelings and emotions to the Hebrew. The heart is where the you of you is. You with me? The heart is where all of this comes from. So when Jeremiah quotes God saying that the heart is deceitful and incurably wicked, he is talking about the part of you that determines your actions. He's talking about the part of you that determines what you think, what you feel, and what you desire. He's talking about your affections. And remember, Jeremiah is a prophet. He's speaking for who? Are these Jeremiah's words? These are God's words. And God is saying that there is nothing more deceptive than the human heart. 
What he's saying is that the heart's desires are deceptively bad. I want you to key on that word deceptive. Sometimes we just get to wicked. The heart is wicked, right? No, 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 that's not enough. The heart is what? Deceitfully wicked. Think about that word. What does it mean to be deceptive? When you're deceived, listen to me, you don't know it. How many guys know that somebody is lying to you and you keep going along with what they're saying? Right? How many of you, someone lies to you and you're like, mm. <laughs> right? And even when you know somebody is lying to you, you're like, that's just not the truth. And you're always wrestling that out. You're always working that out. Why? Because you're not going to live your life in view of what is false. Yes? That the heart is deceptive means that you don't know it. We don't walk around intentionally believing in a lie, generally, <laughs> right? I don't think many of us walk around choosing to be deceived, but here's the thing. Your desires, your affections are deceiving you and you don't know it. The heart is deceptively wicked above all things. When the text says, who can understand it? It is asking, as the NLT puts it, who really knows how bad it is? That's a rhetorical question to which the answer is, no one. <laughs> we don't even know how deep the brokenness and the wickedness and the deceitfulness of our heart is. Do you catch that? Like, we can't even plunge the depths of that. We don't understand how that is. The biblical perspective of the heart is not a heart that is ultimately good, but a heart that is totally corrupted by sin. See, the worldview for the heart is that it's ultimately good, yes? And the Bible says, actually, it's the most deceptively wicked thing that there is. The contrast could not be more greater than those two realities. See, because either your heart is good and you can trust it, or your heart is bad and you should run away from it, yes? And yet so often, that messaging of following our desires is what, is what leads us down our life's path. And we go, man, that feels right. It seems right. I think this is okay. I want that anyway, so I'm going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. And yet, church, we don't know how bad or how deceptive or how wicked the human heart is. And yet, we are constantly told and try to follow it. How incredibly absurd. Yes? I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that we would say yes to that, that we would say yes, I'm going to lean into that, I'm going to go with that. C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful book called The Screwtape Letters. In the screw tape letters, he's, he's got this demon writing letters back to Satan that's describing how he's going to tempt this man into falling into sin, okay? It's a fabulous book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. So there's this exchange that's going on. And in the second edition of his screw tape letters in the introduction, C.S. Lewis wrote this. Some have paid me an undeserved compliment by supposing that my letters were the ripe fruit of many years' study in moral and ascetic theology, I think that he got out and went and just plunged the depths of, the, of humanity and society to figure out how evil the heart is. But he says this, they forgot that there is an equally reliable, though less credible, way of learning how temptation works. My heart, I need no others, showeth me the wickedness of the ungodly. C.S. Lewis became aware of the deceptiveness of his own heart. And to write that book, by the way, if you read that book, you're going to be like, yeah, that's my temptation. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that's my, oh, that's an, oh, there's another one. That's another one. He writes a book that's universally common to humanity because he understands what's going on inside of his heart. And how many of you could agree with Lewis said, man, if you tore my heart apart, if you looked at what's going on in my heart, in my affections, in my desires, I don't think you'd like how much you see. Yeah. See, it's easy for us, church, to say, 
The problem's out there. The problem is right here. The reason we are lovers of self, the reason we choose to follow our hearts is because our hearts are deceptive and they don't tell us that we are pursuing evil. They lead us down a road we think looks right. They lead us down a path that feels right to us. Guys, listen, the promise of finding happiness by following your heart is a baseless promise. It's a baseless promise. It's baseless because it doesn't have an anchor of truth to latch onto. The reality is that when we follow our hearts, it's not gonna lead us to no regrets. It's gonna lead us down the road of regret. The problem is it's gonna lead us to places that we never thought we'd have to go. And we have to ask the question, why? Why are our hearts deceptive? Why? Why can't we trust them? What happened to make them this way? What happened in our heart to bring us to this reality? I want to dive in here, church, so stay with me. I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. If you're using one of our Bibles, it's page number 2. I memorized it today, see? Page number 2. I'm going to summarize, before we pull that up, I'm going to summarize what's going on here. In chapter 1 through verse 2, 4, we have this, this view of God, Elohim, this cosmic God, transcendent over all creation, speaking creation into existence, yes? And after he speaks something into creation, he looks at it, and what does he say? And he saw that it was good, good. How many times does he say that? A bunch, okay? <laughs> Everything he creates, every day he says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And we get to two, chapter 2, verse 4, and we have the story of Yahweh, Elohim and Yahweh. Yahweh, same God. What's the difference? The difference is Elohim is up here, Yahweh's down here, kneeling in the dirt, forming humanity out of the clay. It's personal God who comes to earth and makes us and breathes through the spirit of God, life into our bodies, animating us, giving us his spirit, creating humankind. And he says that we were made male and female in the image of God. We were made and we were made good. He says actually very good. Good. Pinnacle of God's creation, placed in the garden. If you know the story, Adam and Eve walked in the garden and the Lord was what? With them. Walking in the midst of the garden with them. And there is wholeness, there's shalom, there's peace, there's prosperity. Things are well and right and good. Everything is good. The plants are? Good. The water is? Good. All right, just checking. But God set a boundary, didn't he? Right? By the way, if you read your Bible, God always sets a boundary. <laughs> Nobody is boundaryless. We are bound by the Lord. We follow him. God sets a boundary. You can eat from any of the trees, any of them, except... One tree, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat from that one. There's a boundary that's set. But listen to what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent, that's why I hate snakes. <laughs> now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You think about that. Any tree, they can't eat of any tree? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, what do he say? You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like, who? Knowing good and evil. We could spend time there. We're not going to. We'll do that another time. But what all that means. It's fantastic. Verse six. So 
When the woman saw that the tree was, what? Good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Eve saw that it was good, a delight, and to be desired. All words that we would use to describe things that are good. To Eve, the fruit didn't look like sin that was going to open the door to death and ruin and contaminate God's good earth, did it? It looked good. She saw it looked good, and she trusted her heart instead of what God had said. Come on. She trusted her own heart. She followed her heart. She made a judgment on her own about what is good. She said, this seems right to me, and therefore she ate of the fruit, and she gave it to her husband. And guess what? In case you want to blame her, he's right there passively letting her do this, yes? And through that one decision, that one decision to listen to the heart, the whole of the human race, except for Jesus, are totally corrupted by sin. Romans 5.12 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. How many of you in here today have never sinned? Good, this is still true. <laughs> All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, yes? We can experientially say yes to that, right? We go, man, you know, and we might judge our sin as great or as not as bad or whatever, as indifferent from somebody else's. We might do that game. I'm better than this person because I didn't do blah, 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 blah. But we have all sinned, yes? Therefore, sin has been passed down to us, yes? Guess what? Sin passes down through generations of humankind through birth. You are born a sinner. In fact, David tells us that in the womb, surely I have sinned through my mother's womb. Sin is passed down down from one human to the next. This is called the doctrine of original sin. The doctrine of original sin is the doctrine that as a result of Adam's fall, all mankind are sinners by nature, having a propensity to sin that underlies every actual sin. Okay, what does that mean? That we are sinners by nature means this. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. See, our nature has been corrupted by sin. That's the problem. The heart is deceptively wicked because the heart has been corrupted by sin. Sin has entered and permeated and has damaged and marred the image of God in humankind. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin out of who we are as sinners. That's our problem. It's our nature to sin. And because it's our nature passed down to all of humanity, we are sinners. And this is a problem that we can't get out of. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is incurably bad. What does that mean? You can't fix it. There's not one of us in this room who would claim to have no sin. And if we did, John 1, 1 John tells us we would call God a liar. <laughs> because we are all sinners by nature, our desires, our affections are totally corrupted. I want you to key in on that, church. And because our desires are corrupted, the affections of our hearts are deceitfully wicked. The affections of our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Eve saw that the fruit of the tree looked good. Guys, the wisdom she could have on her own apart from God was what appealed to her. She wanted to do it her own way. Her affections were toward herself and her making her own decisions. Eve's heart wanted to be God herself. We'll unpack that at another time. But in the moment of sin, I want you to key on this. Eating the fruit seemed right to Eve. Seemed right 
didn't seem wrong or bad or sinful. It seemed good. It seemed right. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to us. Because of our sinful nature, guys, our affections, our desires seem right when in fact they lead to death. That's the reality. Our desires lead us to death. And so I want to ask you some questions today. Some of you are like, dang it, (laughs) where's the hope? Come back next week. (laughs) But I want to ask you some questions because there is hope. What in your life seems right to you but is in fact leading you to death? There they are. What in your life seems right to you but is leading to death? Are you trusting your own heart instead of the voice of God to determine what is right and wrong? I want you to ask yourself that question. Am I trusting what I feel, what I think, what, I, what my affections are leading me toward? Am I trusting that or am I trusting what God says? Number three, are you submitted to his word and his way as opposed to your own? You're going, man, I'm I'm just kind of, I can do this. I can decide for myself. I can follow my heart, lean in with what all that is. Are you listening to what he's doing? Are you submitted to that? By the way, submission doesn't happen without disagreement. (laughs) Okay? I'm not submitted if I just agree with everything you tell me to do and I just keep doing it. That's just called compliance. Submission is I don't agree, but I'm gonna subject what I think to what you say. That's what we're doing to the Lord. Number four, do you recognize the condition of your heart apart from God? Do you recognize that apart from God, this is what's happening in your heart, that this is what's taking you, this is what's driving you, this is what's keeping you? Do you recognize that? Number five, do you recognize that your heart will deceive you into thinking you are right when you are headed into death? Do you recognize that? I want you to take a few moments. Uh, there's a note page you were hand when you came in. Write something down. Get real with the Lord here for a moment. We're going to sing a, a song here to close. But I want you to take a moment to do this now with the Lord. Father, would you speak to our hearts even now as we lean in? Reveal to us by your spirit. The verse after Jeremiah 17, 9, Jeremiah 17, 10 says, who searches the heart? The Lord searches the heart. The Lord knows the heart. God, would you know our hearts? Would you search our hearts right now as we pray, as we come before you? You guys take that time and do it now, all right? 